something people forget is influencers have always exist. They were just called celebrities before. The definition is evolving and changing and it's going to continue to evolve and change. If you have a platform and an audience, you are an influencer, you have an influence of some sort. And I think it's actually a really powerful thing if you think about it because it makes you realize anyone can be an influencer and it makes people empowered to use their voice. You've probably heard it time and time again on this podcast that influencer marketing not only works, but could be the key to unlocking massive business potential for your e-commerce business, if it's done right. Influencers have the power to take a product or an entire brand from unknown to trending overnight. And sometimes the community that they build is so valuable, it creates a jumping off point for a business of their own. And that's exactly what Deepika Matiala did when she launched Live Tinted. On this episode of Up Next in Commerce, Deepika takes us through how she progressed as an entrepreneur at Birchbox before she took the plunge and set out on her own journey. And it all started after one beauty video that she made went viral on YouTube. Deepika explains how she went about building a community based on a mission to bring more diversity to the industry and how she's been able to tap into that community to create content and launch a successful business with products designed specifically for her community. Plus, Deepika reveals some of the advice she got from investors and her mentors like Bobby Brown and Andy Dunn. Enjoy this episode. Up Next in Commerce is brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud. Respond quickly to changing customer needs with flexible e-commerce connected to marketing, sales, and service. Deliver intelligent commerce experiences your customers can trust across every channel. Together, we're ready for what's next in commerce. Learn more at salesforce.com slash commerce. Before we get into the episode, I would love it if you could hit subscribe and give the show a rating and review. I really want to know what you think and hear how we're doing. All right, on to the interview. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to Up Next in Commerce. This is your host, Stephanie Postles, co-founder at Mission.org. Today, we're talking to Deepika Mutiala. There you go. You nailed it. (laughs) The CEO of a beauty brand, Live Tinted. Deepika, welcome. Thanks for having me. How many times do people pause when they're like, I'm about to botch your name. I know it. I know it. Uh, There it goes. I mean, a lot, but I appreciate the pause and effort to get it right versus like, just like blatant (laughs) lack of attempt to try and get it right. So I appreciate you trying. Thank you. (laughs) Good. Yeah, thanks. So I was doing a bit of research as I always do on my guests and I am fascinated by Live Tinted. I mean, you have such a great story, so much stuff I want to dive into. But first, I think it'd be fun to kind of talk through how you got here, your background. What did you do before you founded Live Tinted? Yeah, so I actually started my career on the corporate side of the beauty industry um, in college. My first internship was at L'Oreal in New York and Post-college, I worked, I had a brief stint at um, Limited Brands, which is now L Brands, which was at Victoria's Secret, which is no longer there because I went bankrupt. So I was there for a brief stint, but the whole goal and end game was to one day create my own beauty brand. Like I was that 16-year-old girl who grew up in Sugarland, Texas, who said that like I was going to change the narrative of what I saw when I was going down the beauty aisles. And, you know, when I was a kid, I shopped at like Walmart prompt but predominantly, honestly, like that's where Mm -hmm. I shopped for beauty because going to shop for beauty wasn't really a thing in my family's life. So like when we were just getting groceries at Walmart, I would like divert to the aisles and go look at makeup and I would find not myself not reflected in the ads. And I would also not see any foundation shades that worked for my skin tone. And I literally remember telling my family at 16 that I was going to change that narrative one day. And everything I've done for my career since that point was to get me to starting Live Tinted. So it's kind of crazy being, I'm now back in Texas, like I was telling you earlier, that like, it's just really full circle being here and finding doodles of me, writing out what I thought my brand name was going to be and talking to family members who are like, this is it's just crazy that you're actually doing it because this is what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so then after a, like a nine months at Limited Brands, I quit my job to take a risk on a, a startup called Birchbox, which at the time was the hottest tech company, not even just beauty, but I think overarching, they created a whole category of subscription model that really created a whole new category. And so that was really cool. Incredible experience working for two badass female founders who, in my parents' eyes, were really okay with me working there and taking a pay cut and going for my dream because the two founders went to HBS. Oh my gosh. 
I also read the quote from your, you're saying, oh, my dad all growing up would hand me a stethoscope and then you would instead grab lipstick or something. And I thought that That's was really funny. Really happened. Yeah. Like um, it's kind of like an Indian tradition where like there's a ceremony that happens. I forget. I think it's after your first hundred days mm-hmm. and we just did it for my nephew where they put things in front of you. Like, is it like, um, like a book versus like, you know, different things to see what you would gravitate towards. And yeah. instead of me gravitating towards anything that was in front of me, I was grabbing my mom's lipstick, like in her hand. <laughs> like in the purse, digging over there. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, which is so funny and crazy and full circle now. But um, but yeah, this was always the dream. And I, 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 it's wild for me to like look back and reflect. But um, I worked at Birchbox and, you know, in true startup culture, you can create opportunities for yourself at a startup. And so... I made it very clear to the founders that I wanted to one day create my own beauty brand. And they gave me opportunities in the company to do that. And I had to do it a lot of times in my free time, you know, like it wasn't like I still had to do my day job, but if there was projects that I could work on in my free time, I did it because I saw it as Birchbox was my business school. And they always said it as founders, right? Like, but I feel, I truly felt it. Like I really felt like working there was an incredible network of really smart people Um, and I got to like, literally you, you have an idea, you can test it and just go for it. And so I got to work on product development at Birchbox. I got to work on influencer partnerships at Birchbox. And when I did that was my first time being like, what is going on in this influencer world? And how much are these girls getting paid? Like what is happening? Some random girl in Iowa getting paid like this insane amount of money to do a YouTube video. And I was just like, this is wild. Yeah. So as I was doing that was when I realized there was nobody who looked like me on YouTube um, creating content. And I kind of just saw it as like a fun hobby. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know what, Deepika, at the end of the day, you're not quitting your job. Just do it on your weekend. And at the end of the day, all the people in your life that text you questions about makeup and things like that, you can just say, go to my channel, stop texting me. But really, I didn't think much of it. And so January of 2015, I picked up my iPhone because again, I didn't know what I was doing video content wise. I had no clue how to like ad revenue wasn't even activated. Like I didn't know. Um, and I picked up my iPhone. I held it vertically instead of horizontally. I, it was like the production. It was like, I knew IGTV was happening before IGTV knew it was happening. I did it in a uh, vertical mode and, um, I used red lipstick under my eyes to mask dark circles. And people who are hearing this are probably literally so confused. I but... read that too. I was like, it would be funny if I showed up with red lipstick under my eyes. <laughs> oh my God, that would have been awesome. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I used red lipstick under my eyes to hide dark circles. And I guess that was crazy to 10 million people because that video went viral and yeah, has millions and millions of views. And, and it uh, worked for anyone who's like, what did that look like? I looked at the pictures and the video. It actually works. So. Yeah. So here's the deal. Like I basically, ha- it was my biggest beauty concern my whole life, like how to hide my dark circles. And it wasn't talked about, like people didn't talk about it because it's such a specific problem to specific communities of people. And so I just did the video and uh, that I had learned when I was on set one day where a makeup artist was using a color corrector under my eyes, like an actual product made for under your eyes. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what are you doing putting red lipstick under your eyes and my eyes? And she was like, oh no, it's a color corrector. It cancels out the darkness. So when you put on your foundation, you really can mask your dark circles because you have extra pigments that like require kind of additional correction. And I was like, well, what's the difference? My brain is always thinking about hacks and simplifying things. And so that doesn't, that doesn't change with my beauty routine. Like I want to always simplify things. And so she basically said not much. And so I filmed this video and it went viral. And when the video was at 4 million views, I got a call from the Today Show to come on to do the segment on air. And I quit my job that day. I kind of just had this moment Mm -hmm. of this could be a cool 15 minutes of fame or I could turn it into my dream career. Oh, that's that's awesome. So that's amazing. What did the founder say? Because I'm guessing you had a pretty close relationship with them. I mean, they were letting you essentially be an entrepreneur within their organization and test things and learn and try. Like, how do they feel about that? Because I saw that they were some of your first found, or uh, first investors along with like Bobby Brown, which I'm like, what? How did you get in front of her? But like, the, so what was that process like leaving and getting them to invest afterwards? Yeah, it was really tough. I mean, so I, there's two co-founders and they, they just had different mindsets, right? Like one of them was more like, 
you are all on a birch tree and you're all acorns that will fall into the world. I remember she said that and she's the one that's currently an investor in my company. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I want to see you grow and thrive. And the other one, it's not to say that she didn't want the same thing, but she was really excited about me growing within the company. And, mm -hmm. and listen, she had every reason to feel that way. Like she helped me get so many opportunities um, within the company to be able to create what I have to been able to do today. And she gave me those opportunities, yeah. but you know, it was more like, I was really close to her too. Like, you know, like we were, were I worked more with her directly. So it, of course it was like one of those bittersweet things, but they're yeah. both incredible and, and really supportive. It was really scary to like, I remember when I got the day I got the email from the today show was when I pulled her into a room that day at 6 PM, like towards the end of the day. And I just was like, I feel like I have to go for it. Mm -hmm. And she gave me a really big hug and said, she's really happy for me. And, um, but you could tell it was like a bittersweet thing, which I yeah. appreciated because at the end of the day, that means she felt that I made an impact. At the yeah. Company. That's, that's great. So what was the today show? Like, would you, did you go on there and do a tutorial? Tell me a bit about that. Oh my gosh. It was wild. So my sister came on and was my model on air. So she flew in from Texas. Um, my dad was backstage sitting next to kid rock, which was like oh hilarious. God. Um, you know, picture this very like immigrant Indian dad who's like, what is even happening? My daughter is on national television. And who is this guy with like a you know, beard and long hair? Like what's going on? It was um, the moment where I realized that I was meant to do exactly what I'm doing in that moment. Mm -hmm. Like I was not nervous. I was just meant to be there, you know, and it, it just felt that way. And you know, that Eminem song, uh, one, uh, what is it? Lose yourself. You yep. get one shot, one opportunity. Mm -hmm. I was listening to that backstage and I literally felt like I had four minutes on national television to show people that a brown girl can do this. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I, I felt like I could be like the Indian Hoda and like just be the next like news anchor on the Today Show. And, you know, I still feel like I love doing live television. I think it's like there is a beauty in the, in the imperfections that come with it. And, um, it was surreal is what mm -hmm. the word is and, and, and incredible. And I remember after it was over, you know, it's the hustle and bustle of live television mm -hmm. is very real. The second the segment's over, they're like, boom, 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 moving on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that was so fun. Let's do it again. And, you know, most people were just like, all right, lady, we're moving on. And, but then there was this senior producer who came up to me and she was like, you should do it again. And I was like, her, like looking around and it's so cool because my dad's in the background recording it. So I have all this on Aww. camera. Yeah. Um, but she just was like, we can't believe it was your first time doing national television. We'd love to have you back regularly. And that was really cool for me because everyone told me that when you go on national television, it's a cool moment in your life and you move on, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like I did the, I proved the exact opposite that if you have what it takes, like you can make things happen for yourself. So I became a regular doing beauty segments on the Today Show and was a full-time influencer, which is, you know, a thing. Yeah, I saw that. That was one of the first things when I was looking into your bio a bit. And it's like, oh, Deepika is an influencer. And I think she's just signed a deal with WME. I'm like, oh, you know, now you've got this status and you're super popular. Like, how did you think about capitalizing on that and to get out of just being an influencer and then being like, I'm going to create my own stuff? Yeah. Well, here's the deal is the, I never grew up saying I wanted to be an influencer or even be famous, but I did grow up saying I wanted to be a CEO and run my own business. Mm -hmm. And so when you fall into something like this, it's very weird. Like I think what got me through the years where I was just an influencer and didn't have the business side of it was the end goal was the same. I wanted to change the face of representation for people who look like me, period. So whether that's in the media or through my own beauty brand, the net goal was the same and it still is the same. And so what I realized was I had this opportunity to create a brand around myself that was really once in a lifetime, honestly. And I was just like, I want to focus in on this and really like learn everything I can about the beauty industry, which at this point I knew a decent amount. You know, I, I worked at Birchbox. I had a lot of beauty brand contacts. And really what I did was after I quit my job, I emailed all my contacts and I was like pretending to be my own assistant. And I was like, I, I'm the assistant to the beauty influencer with 10 billion views, today show beauty expert, blah, 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 blah. Um, if you want to work with her, like, and for every like hundred emails I sent, I got like one reply. And that one reply led to my first job where they asked me my rate and I had no idea what to say. And then when they said, okay, I realized, damn it, I could have asked for triple. And Yep. You just learn as you go and you're your own assistant, producer, editor, manager, agent, sometimes lawyer, which I don't recommend. And yep. like, 
<laughs> bad idea. Um, yeah. But you just you just learn as you go. And so I think for me, what got me through being the girl who was waking up and taking selfies and posting it for like literally a career, like I got paid to do that, was that I really saw a, a narrative in the beauty industry that didn't exist when I was growing up. There was no token brown girl. And even then, like, right, there wasn't even, there wasn't really a token black girl growing up. Like that was still in the, like, now I feel like we're finally, it still has so, so much work to do. But I do think that we now have representation happening more than I ever saw growing up. But there still is this tokenism that happens where like, I felt like for three years, as grateful as I am that I've been able to work with, you know, every beauty brand under the sun, like a L'Oreal commercial to a Samsung ad that aired during the Golden Globes and like just any beauty brand I could have dreamt of. I also realized there's plenty of people out there that deserve the shot to also do that. And there shouldn't just be one of me. Like there's not just one white girl in the campaign. Why shouldn't there be more brown girls in the campaign, more black girls in the campaign? And that kind of is really what led to that, that experience as an influencer is what led me to launching Live Tinted as a community platform prior to launching the actual product itself. I didn't plan for that. Again, like that, that being a community brand wasn't a thing growing up either, but it was lived in experience that truly inspired the idea that like before this launches with a physical product, let's create this united community where they dictate our future decisions. And really for me, honestly, I was craving a home where people were talking about things in the beauty industry that was not a thing like topics, heavy, heavy topics like colorism, but then other topics like facial hair and like things that you just didn't say, you know? And yes. I, and, and so we, we, we create this almost like collective home where every day we were just posting about faces that I felt like you didn't traditionally see being shown in campaigns. And it just started to organically grow into this very, very engaged community, which then at a point I was like, let's create products for them. It's time. And, and that's kind of what led to our first product launch in May of 2019. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had a really cool company on uh, from Food52. Same thing. They built up a oh, huge yeah. community first. And then afterwards, she was like, oh, it was only right to then start creating products to service that community. But my biggest question is always like, how did you build that community? How did you transfer the audience from like, you know, TV to then, you know, go into your community or from Instagram or YouTube or wherever you were, how did you pull them in and get them engaging in a way where you're like, they're here for the long haul. And now I can move on to phase two of a product. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I think for, on, for me, I feel very grateful that those three years as an influencer, I created a community of people who felt very connected to me because again, there wasn't a lot of brown girls doing this. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like they would be ride or die for anything I, I put out into the world. But that is to me a huge responsibility. And it was like, okay, so now if I create this brand, I don't want it to be about me. I want it to be about something so much bigger than myself. So if I had just launched it, which a lot of investors in the beginning were saying to me, like, why do you have to create this community first and spend money on, you know, creating content as a community platform and things like, you already have a following, create a product, show proof of concept and build it out. Like, you know, and I, I just didn't listen. And I felt really strongly that like Live Tinted was bigger than my own identity. It was about a larger multicultural group of individuals coming together and finding common ground in, in the, an industry where I felt like people were so divisive. And so I, I really wanted to kind of bridge that gap and create a really powerful, I think like warm home for people. Which, you know, I, I think a lot of brands are saying they're doing now. And, and, and it, it's awesome, right? Like, I'm not hating. I, I think it's all for the greater good. But people are smart and they can understand when some people are being performative versus not. And I feel very grateful that since day one, we've had values and, and core beliefs. Of course, they evolve. But the core belief is around diversity and inclusion is the pillar that has stood strong since the beginning. And so for me, on an actual tactical level... The first 20,000 followers, I would say, came directly from my following. Like from, I, I think like, I remember before we even launched it, I was trying to find photos of deeper skin brown women online and it was virtually impossible. Like I was just searching and the team was searching and I was like, you know what? Let's use the power of social media. And I just posted on my Instagram, I'm working on a project on stories. If you see any deeper skin melanated brown women, use hashtag live tinted. 
I'm not even kidding. Within minutes, it was the hashtag with Tinted was flooded with just tags. It was just like this community of women who have been thriving to be seen. They are just craving for this industry who has neglected them to pay attention to them. And so when you ask like how I did it, I sure like my following definitely helped do it. But what really did it was that there was just a natural need. These people didn't have another home and they, they were excited to finally have it. And so I also think that it, it grew from just being a South Asian Brown collective to being much larger because again, like I talked about topics that were like very specific to me in my life. I didn't force it and try to like speak to something that I didn't know personally. And with that, I recognized colorism is not an issue in just the South Asian community. To be honest, like I learned, I'm learning so much as we build this brand that like, I had no idea this is something that so many different cultural backgrounds face um, around the world. And that actually excited me because I realized that there is an opportunity to create a brand with pillars that, like I said, unite people from all different cultural backgrounds rather than divide. Um, And so it just organically grew from there just by talking about things that I lived in and experienced my life. Yeah, that's very cool. So how many people are in your community now? So it's, well, it's a, Tricky number because I say 600,000 because I include my community as well. Mm -hmm. Um, because quite honestly, my whole brand has shifted to like just deep lip tinted stuff. Um, which I love. Um, so yeah, we're a a little over 600,000. Cool. And how do you think about keeping them engaged on the different channels? Like, what are you doing now? This may be different than when you started out in what, 2015, 2017? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, cause my brand started in 2015 and then Live Tinted started in 2018. Um, mm-hmm. But you have to evolve with the times. Like perfect example is hello, TikTok. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Which well, actually my favorite influencer is an Indian girl on there with her dad. Oh she's, yeah. She's she, amazing. What's I her love name? Her. Oh, I can't uh, she, she, Sheena. Is it Sheena? So it starts with an S. Yeah. She's so funny, but you never see her dad it's always just his responses to things that she's doing. I've never seen it, her dad anyways, in any of her videos, but she's my favorite. She's hilarious. I'm obsessed with her. And yeah, like, I feel like there's this understood, like, brown community bond where we're rooting for each other because it's like so many of us were told to be doctors and go down this traditional path. So like, yeah, I mean, we actually, one of my goals for the brand is to like spotlight not your traditional beauty influencers, but people like her mm-hmm. um, who are just creating creators. Like, I think there's this incredible creative community that I've come across just from building with Tinted that like deserves so much spotlight. And and I ha- we have big plans to only continue to spotlight them in a bigger way as yeah. the brand continues to grow, which I'm excited about. Yeah. What was your question again? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So... I took a, I like to derail things every once in a while, but uh, <laughs> back to saying, like you said, you had to change with the times from like what you used to do to what you do now. And you said, of course, you know, TikTok, like, yeah, what are you doing today to keep your audience engaged? And how do you think about, you know, treating the different platforms different? Like what's, what's engaging yeah. people right now or connecting with them best? Well, I think first and foremost, I tried, I don't try to pretend like I know something that I don't know. And so luckily at this stage in the business, like bringing in an intern that's in college that can do TikTok for us because yeah. like, I'm like, wait, so you do like this, what is this dance move? Like what's going on? Like, so I think like hiring subject matter experts is like something that I feel like finally, oh my gosh, like, cause I've been just doing everything for the longest time that like now it's like, let's, let's hire for people to do what they're good at. Mm-hmm. But of course you have to have a pulse and know what to even hire for. Right. Like, it's like, am I looking for an email expert? Like if you're only, you have your, an X amount of budget, if you're going to focus in on email versus so social versus paid versus all these other marketing levers, you know, what makes sense? Like, for example, for us, influencer is such a critical part of the business because a lot of them are my personal relationships, but we need to continue to grow that network to, you know, the people like, just like the girl you just mentioned, like mm-hmm. there's a whole community of people that are continuing to create and build every year. And so for me, it's about staying on the pulse and, and making sure you feel comfortable evolving with the times. Like, Facebook is still a powerful, powerful sales channel um, for sure. And so we do need to be relevant on there. But if you're a small team and you have to pick and choose your efforts, like for us, it's been deprioritized and Mm -hmm. like eventually we'll get back there. But I'm way excited about Live Tinted impacting the next generation and helping them be a more tinted future where everyone like sees beyond the hues of their skin. And so I get really excited about tapping into a younger audience because they are the future of like this entire 
industry than going towards maybe an older audience. So like these to me are just like the little things you have to keep your mind on. Like what is your goals? What is the audience you think that you can really tap into and what are they doing? And then you decide your marketing levers based on that. Yep. So how are you thinking about tapping into TikTok then? I mean, you're mentioning, you know, partnering with an influencer who isn't a beauty influencer, but could still probably drive results. And I know earlier you said like influencers and you kind of cringe too when thinking about that. So like, tell me a bit about, you know, how do you partner with them? Does it work? Like, how do you make sure that it works? All the details behind that. Yeah. And you know, I cringed because I feel like that the word influencer has been so like, um, it's, it's, it's been created into this like comedic relief for people. And I, and I think that's what makes me cringe. But Mm -hmm. One thing that I feel really, really strongly about is the value of these creators. Like I, I think of them as like creatives that are just really changing the landscape of marketing. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that it's just the word influencer used to really make me cringe because I felt like it wasn't respected. And as somebody who went through being an influencer, and I still am an influencer, at the end of the day, if you have a, by the way, something people forget is influencers have always exist. They were just called celebrities before. Yeah. And the, 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 just the definition is evolving and changing, and it's going to continue to evolve and change. If you have a platform and an audience, you are an influencer. You have an influence of some sort. And I think it's actually a really powerful thing if you think about it, because it makes you realize anyone can be an influencer and it makes people empowered to use their voice. But the part that I get really excited about, like I said earlier, was like this creative community and how we can work with them. And like, like the same way I told you, like these girls were like just wanting to be seen. These creatives are just like wanting to be seen and they've never been given the opportunity to be seen. So Mm -hmm. how is it that Live Tinted as a brand can tap into these people and really invest time and effort as an internal team to search for these people and work with them and not go like go against the grain and go against who everyone else is wanting to work with. And listen, we're still a small company. So paid partnerships is something that I can't wait to be able to do. It's like, are you kidding? Like that's, I went through it. I want to be able to do it for other people. Mm -hmm. So we're working on trying to grow those relationships now. So when we can, when we have like a full budget in place, that's, you know, we support these, I would say underdogs versus going towards the people that everyone else was going to, because that's no fun. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's a big theme that I'm hearing too, is finding more of the micro influencers who have a very engaged following, but they might only have a few thousand followers versus a million, but those few thousand are ready to convert and, you know, really... Buy the products and do the things that you're doing. How do you go about finding those people? I mean, it seems hard to have to go through, you know, TikTok and Instagram and find your people that might not show up on your feed right away if you are kind of searching through all that. Well, there's a lot of cool tools now that we've actually just invested in. Like, um, honestly, for me, I my plan was to do it the old school way of just like investing the time finding people, um, mm-hmm. and like that. That to me was like the way to go, but there's supplemental tools. Like there's this, um, there's this new platform. I don't actually, I don't know if it's new, it's new for us. It's called Grin. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, a, it's a way to manage your influencer, um, partnerships and relationships. So you can actually have like data and analytics to back up why you're doing certain decisions. And it's like traditionally in PR, you send products out, you hope somebody posts about it. Who knows if you, they do tracking that is really like, it, it's just a lot. So you need to have the manpower to be able to do it. And now there's these tools in place that make it a little bit more scalable, which is really great. Um, but I, I don't think anything can beat the like just human aspect of finding a gem of a person and saying, this is who I want to grow with. And I, I now, luckily, now that there's a team in place, I can spend my time doing those things because I, first of all, I truly believe like that is the special sauce that comes from a brand is like those little efforts you put in that mm-hmm. take time that really set you apart from the others out there. Like, I don't want to be the person who partners with the biggest TikToker and not just because of the financial reason, which I think, I don't want to speak for other people, but I think a lot of times that the theme is to go to micro or nano influencers because of budget reasons. Yeah. And to me, it's it's really exciting that like they're untapped and have a voice mm-hmm. that they're, you just want to continue to empower that voice, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I love that. So how do you think about strategic partnerships or when it comes to, you know, when you're getting investors, I mean, I'm thinking, okay, you have Bobby Brown on there who, you know, is very big in the makeup space. What did that look like? Did you have that in mind when you partnered with her? Of like, oh, maybe you can kind of showcase my line, you know, along with your brand or, you know, how does that work? And how did you think about picking strategic investors instead of just going with, you know, the first person who might give you money? 
Yeah, that's actually exactly what happened too. So I, I learned so much through my fundraising process. It was my first time doing it. And what I came out of it realizing was nothing is more valuable than experience. That includes a, a check. Mm -hmm. Like I think I was taking people's check, but really what I was taking was their experience. Like that's what I wanted yep. to learn from. And so I had a couple term sheets where it was like one large check from one VC and which by the way, that whole process is like a whole thing in itself. But I feel grateful to say that like, I actually don't feel like I had as much trouble being a woman of color, getting investors on board as much as I think I've heard a lot of my other girlfriends who are women of color, specifically black women, which is like just all sorts of messed up in its own right that like, I feel very honestly like grateful that I didn't go through that. But I also think it's really messed up that I didn't go through that as much. But that process has taught me so much and what I want to do in my future of like, you know, like I, there's so much I want Live Tinted to do to help other women who want to create their own brands. When I went through that process, I was like, wow, I really don't want one person this early in my business to dictate my decision making. Yep. You know, you're learning so much in the beginning. And like the last thing you want is for someone who had, knows nothing about your business, who just gave you a check to say, you need to go into this retailer or you need to do this partnership or grow this or hire this person. So instead, what I did was tap into a network of people who I've worked my ass off to build my entire career and tell them I'm launching my own brand. And you've been somebody who has been a mentor in my life in some capacity and really position it as an opportunity to be a part of the growth of what I'm building. And I, I feel very confident about, I still feel that way. I know, and I feel very confident about what I'm building and what the impact is going to have on the world. And, and so I went to all of these mentors or just advisors in my life, and they put in more angel checks, strategic angel checks, really to mm -hmm. just to get their advice. Like any, yeah. I'm learning from their mistakes. Like Andy Dunn from Bonobos, like the other day I sent my investor, um, I sent my annual investor update and he was like, continue to focus on profitability. Don't overspend on marketing. Learn from my mistakes. Like I'm learning from all of their mistakes. Pyle Kadakia from ClassPass, she would say, focus on your why. Don't ever get distracted from the why. You know, and Bobby Brown, she was the first to tell me, go on a mother date. <laughs> that's what she told me to do. She literally told me to go on it and she used that word. So that's why I said that. I apologize. That's great. But that was, that's Bobby for you. Like she yeah. is such a dope woman. Like she is no, no BS. Um, mm -hmm. She told me she was like, at the end of the day, you will succeed because that's who you are, but you don't want to look back and wonder what was it all for if you don't have someone to share it with. And so, you know, maybe that's a part of the reason I came back to Texas and I'm kind of taking a step back and, and zooming in on things, but they all give me different advice for different, you know, their own nuggets of, of what they went through. And Haley mm -hmm. Barna from Birchbox, who's now a partner at First Round Capital, she put in a personal check. And I, I, I feel like I could always call her to ask her about fundraising advice because they've obviously raised so much money. It's just truly invaluable to be able to talk to people who've gone through the mistakes and the ringer to say, I'm thinking about perfect. I'll give you an example right now. Food 52, I love what they're doing. You mentioned them earlier. I mm -hmm. love what they're doing. I love yeah. the idea of this, uh, you know, uh, a collective e-commerce shop where you're creating content to commerce. Like, I, I think it's really smart. And I've gotten distracted in the past of wanting Live Tinted to also be that as a collective home for in inclusive beauty. Like I wanted to create the next Sephora.com that truly zoomed in and focused in on, you won't be on our site unless you are caring about inclusivity. Yep. That doesn't mean you have to be a POC owned brand. We will absolutely prioritize it mo more than most people do. But I had this vision. And at the end of the day, I think the biggest, hardest thing for founders to remember is to stay focused mm -hmm. and, you know, eye on the prize. And I think that doesn't mean I don't want to still do it one day, but we have way too much momentum happening as a, as a singular brand that I think um, I just have to stay focused and, and these kinds of, founders in my life if I call them and I'm like, but what if we blah 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 like they they will all pull me back and say, all in good time, young grasshopper. <laughs> That's awesome. And I mean that is the time when a lot of founders do kind of want to, you know, start seeing profit, want to go big, want to experiment in a bunch of different areas. And I think that's really smart. And I also love Bobby Brown's advice too. I mean, I love the personal yeah. aspect when you find people like that. Another thing on the Bobby Brown thing, her specifically we met through the DM. Mm -hmm. 
Um, That's great. I had, yeah, like, you know, you can connect with anyone in the world. You have no clue what the power of social media. There's so much negative that comes with it, but there's so much positive. And mm -hmm. I remember on my launch day, in I was in New York City doing a ton of press. And I went to Jersey to meet with Bobby Brown in person. And she was like, wait, your launch day is today and you're here? And I was like, yeah, you're Bobby Brown. <laughs> like, of course I'm here. <laughs> yes, of course I'm here. Because to me, she was doing inclusive beauty before inclusive beauty was inclusive beauty. Like, And mm -hmm. as a Jewish woman who grew up in New York, like, I just find it to be so impressive that she recognized that she was like, like she sees it as like, obviously I care about making sure that everyone feels represented. Like that's how she sees it. And I just, I, I feel like I wanted to learn from that person. And I, I want to create my own Bobby Brown cosmetics one day. And, and, and I, I feel like with her guidance, I'm well on my way. Yeah, that's cool. So, I mean, you have a lot of good mentors and investors. I mean, Andy Dunn's another good one. He actually is, was our first investor in our company too, oh, wow. in our convertible note. So good people you got there. What is something that they're um, guiding you on right now for 2021? Like, how are they kind of, you know, I mean, Andy, he's has Walmart that he got to look at. Like he has a lot of things that he can see around e-commerce at Walmart. What are people like that saying right now? Like, hey, Deepika, you need to start preparing for this, or we're seeing this shift at our company. So maybe you need to kind of, you know, pivot or adjust or do something different to be ready for this new world. Anything high level like that? Um, I think the biggest theme and general advice is slow and steady growth for the win. Mm -hmm. And that's very different from what I was told when I was first fundraising in 2018. It was all about the next billion dollar unicorn company. Yeah. And I have a couple people who were unicorn companies, Pyle Kadaki as an investor. And, and, and it's like, they are all also advising me, like, just don't get caught up in the noise. Don't get caught up in the quick turnaround story. And and the more I'm seeing, you know, what's happening in this bubble that's like kind of bursting, it's like, I'm so happy that we didn't take on a ton of funding. We're growing slow. Um, and I'm going through the fundraising process right now for like our Series A. And, you know, the reality is that we don't need to fundraise right now. It's like this, it's this back and forth of like, we're doing really well and we can go really slow. Um, but at the same time, you know, like you said, Andy is um, with uh, Walmart and, and and one thing we're exploring right now is retail partnerships. And so one thing that I think is um, very apparent now is it's a very different e-commerce and D to C climate than it was five years ago, as we know. And mm -hmm. and I think the idea of being omni-channel is, is an, it's not an option. We have to be omni-channel to also beyond just like the business and the metrics, because myself being, again, that 16-year-old girl who dreamt of having her own beauty brand. It's about impact too. And I want my physical products to be able to be touched and held by people who are in yeah. store. And again, go down those beauty aisles and actually see yourself and, you know, like actually see yourself represented. And I feel like we're the brand that, that needs to do that and, um, in, a, in, a, in a big way. So yeah, beauty feels hard to me though, from e-commerce. I mean, I'm just thinking about, I went to Tarte, which mm -hmm. is of course a beauty website and I was ordering things on there and it still feels so hard to figure out what you need to buy based on your skin tone. And it's asking me all these crazy questions, which you're probably like, yeah, those are obvious ones. Like, do you have a pink with a yellow undertone? Undertone. And a I'm like, I, and it literally had 50 like options. And I'm like, I don't know. Am I pink? Am I yellow? Like, am I green? I'm not really sure. So yeah, beauty feels hard. Like how, I mean, I know obviously being in retail, being in person is important, but during this time right now where that's been a little bit harder, how did you think about adopting your e-commerce experience in a way that people could know what they wanted or what yeah. was meant for their skin? Like, it just feels so hard. It, and it is really hard. That's totally true. Um, we're actually going through a site revamp right now, and it's all going to focus on community, which I know is such a buzzword. But the best thing we can do is tap into all these people who, again, have been just dying to be seen and be featured. And they're not like the person with all these following, like whatever, this massive following. And to me, what we can do is, is the best marketing tool we have is them and like mm -hmm. see them, the product, have them create the content, have them be the things we feature on our website. So people like you can go directly to the site and see themselves and say, oh, well, I look like her. Yeah. So then I can, um, I, it, it just helps. And I think, I think Rent the Runway is the first example I saw of a company that I, I remember shopping it and like picking a dress because I saw girls who had my body type and I was like, oh, well, yeah. she, you know, all the reviews, I think it was Yachtco that they use on their website that mm -hmm. like is really 
great customer review experience. And I remember when we created LiveTented.com, I wanted to use Yacht Post, so we do, for our review system um, because I wanted it to feel really real, like a Yelp kind of situation where you're like truly feeling like you trust that person telling you which product works for you. So it's tough, but there's tools and ways to make it better. And I think just leaning into people and humans and having them be a part of the experience and creating a really strong customer service experience. So they want to leave that review. Yeah, that's great. I also think that technology is evolving to a place now where, you know, you should be able to have your face in front of your camera and take a picture and then be like, here's exactly what would go best, you know, with your skin tone or something. It's getting there. I think like, and there's apps and stuff too, right? Like where you can do that, but it, lighting is such a factor. We're yeah. getting there, but like with, with beauty, it is tricky. And I think all the tools I've seen thus far, none of them have worked for me, but yeah. I, that was one of the business model, like business ideas I wanted to do in college. I was like, it's just too hard to shop for beauty yeah. online. Um, we'll yeah. get there though. Yep. I think so too. All right, so let's shift over to the lightning round. The lightning round is brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud. This is where I'm gonna ask you a question and you have a minute or less to answer. Are you ready? Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. <laughs> what one thing will have the biggest impact on e-commerce in the next year? I would say new ways of leaning into people and community. Yep. Yeah, I, I would say like, I just said that, but that that's, that's we're currently revamping our e-commerce site and the biggest thing we're focusing on is people and experience and, and tapping into the human aspect of what people are looking for when they're buying something, which is as emotional mm -hmm. as a color corrector to solve their dark circle issues. And so I think if you continue to focus in on people, community, how they can drive purchase decisions, you'll thrive in the e-commerce world, especially in beauty where things are very like you want to see yourself reflected. Yeah, I love that. What's the nicest thing anyone's ever done for you? Wow. Is this like personal or business? I mean, whatever comes to mind, whatever you want. Well, I think th this is the first thing that comes to mind because we just talked about it. Um, you know, you should always value every person you meet in life because you never know where it's going to lead and come back and connect and help you in the future. Because I didn't work directly with Haley at Birchbox, but when I quit my job for her to, she introduced me to X Factor Ventures, which was our first VC that came on board um, that gave us our first check which then created a ripple effect that made other people think we were legit, that created mm -hmm. another ripple effect. And I think like that confidence in somebody who like only like, you know, I worked with her, but at a very like um, bird's eye view and stuff. And so it's kind of like, I'm so grateful for that. And not just her, just generally, I think when I think about the people who have taken the bet on me, mm -hmm. I think it, it really makes me feel like I'm here for a reason. Yep. That's great. What e-commerce tool are you most excited about right now? Right now it's Grin. Yeah. That's the one that we're literally like doing trainings on right now. We're really trying to optimize. I think the influencer partnership space is something everyone's trying to figure out and find a way to scale. And I'm hoping and hopeful that Grin can help us do that. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. We will check that out also. Yeah. If you were to have a podcast, what would it be about? And who would your first guest be? Well, I'm working on getting this started, but it's going to, be, it'll be called Hue to Know, which was um, like, instead of Hue to Know, Hue to Know. Yeah, I like that. That's cute. Uh, and, and we had a whole video series for Live Tinted when we were just a community platform where we interviewed people. They came on and they talked about their identity and culture. And it was all these like, to me, they were like dope creatives. Again, like people that you should know about that you may not, like a Black Muslim rapper or a gender non-conforming South Asian artist and like these people who are like, I'm going against the grain and creating a path for myself and living tinted. It's that's really to me what that means and what live tinted stands for. So I want to bring them on as a guest and create it into a podcast form. And my first dream guest would be Meghan Markle because I, I um, think she's incredible. That sounds great. Well, if you need help getting that off the ground, you know who to call. Great. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. And then the last one, what is your favorite business book where you often go back and think about it or, you know, read quotes from it or whatever it may be. Man, I wish I had it so I could show it to you right now. This was a pile recommendation. Uh, it's called financial something, financial terms, financial. I, I'm going to have to like find it and send it to you. What's it about? Yeah. So, but she told me before you go into fundraising process as a person who's never done it before, there's a lot of terms that get thrown around like convertible notes and cap tables yeah. and all this stuff. I didn't know what I was doing. So she was like, it's going to feel like you're reading a dictionary and it's going to be dense, but you want to be able to walk into those meetings with full confidence. And yeah. I highly recommend that you read it. And so 
I have to look for the book and find the name. It, there's a lot of different terms in there. So I'm blanking yeah. on the title itself. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a, a good book that it reminds me of called Venture Deals by, I think it's Brad Feld. That's that what it was. Oh, is that what it is? Damn it. It was Venture Deals. You're right. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Well, close because I'm like, that's a good one too, where I remember when we were that thinking about raising money, I'm like, all these terms, I don't know what they're pre-money, post-money, cap yeah. table, like, oh my God, what are we talking about? So that's yeah, a good that book for anyone raising money right now. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, thanks Fun so much. Book, but it's a good book, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good book. And then after you read it, you're like, hey, I'm done with that for a while. Yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining the show. It was so fun having you on. Where can people find out more about you and your work? Well, I'm obviously going to plug Live Tinted first. Live Tinted is L-I-V-E-T-I-N-T-E-D, livetinted.com, at Live Tinted on all social. And then you can also follow me at, at Deepika, D-E-E-P-I-C-A on all social outlets. Amazing. Thanks so much. Hey, listeners. Thanks for tuning into this episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you haven't already, please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. It helps spread the word, and I would greatly appreciate it. See you next time. Up Next in Commerce is brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud and created by the team at mission.org. Subscribe now at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Podcasts.